Welcome to this uh, public lecture at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, I should say that uh, some, some of the people in today's audience uh, are actually newly registered students at the school. So I'd like uh, to take this opportunity to uh, welcome you to the school and for many of you as well to, to welcome you uh, to Singapore. So this is the first uh, public lecture I think that you'll be experiencing and true to uh, public policy schools in general, there'll be very many uh, during the semester, during the year. So we hope that you will continue uh, to attend these. They are very much a part of the uh, educational uh, landscape that we offer here at the school. So we're very, very, very fortunate today to have uh, as our speaker, Professor Cynthia Schneider. Uh, who is a distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Uh, she is co-director of Muslims on Screen and Television Initiative Resource, and she is also a former U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands. So will you please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Snyder. Thank you so much, Professor Tan, and thank you, um, Anne Verbeek, for organizing this and also in absentia to your dean. Um, I appreciate very much the chance to speak uh, before you today. Uh, it's great to have such an international audience. It's great to have so many students so eager at the beginning of your career at the Lee Kuan Yew School. After this lecture, you may say, what on earth have I gotten myself into? What is this place? So I just want to say, I, I mean, this is not necessarily, this is not the policy of the Lee Kuan Yew School, although you're most welcome to endorse it at the end, but these are really my, um, my ideas. I want to talk with you today about a number of different topics, but basically looking at what is diplomacy today in this 24-7 era of communication, social media, citizen journalism, uh, citizens' movements around the world? How, how does that affect diplomacy and how is diplomacy responding or not? Um, I hate to have anyone standing. It's bad enough to have to sit through one of my lectures, so maybe people could <laughs> move over their seats. I see seats, so maybe people could move over and, and uh, open up the seats in the middle. Thank you so much. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with these basic terms of soft and hard, hard power. Let me just briefly um, run through them. Uh, I don't like really the term soft power because it sort of implies something possibly weak if it's soft. But on the other hand, I like to use it because it's really entered into the lexicon of international affairs. And I like it because Joseph Nye of the Kennedy School, in his definition, he emphasizes attraction. So what that means is you can't really impose soft power. That means that it only works if people look at you and admire you for what you are doing and want in some way to emulate, learn from you. Uh, the, and what I'm going to suggest is something that is really important in today's world is in order to have that kind of soft power, that power of attraction, you really have to walk the walk. A country, a person, a region, a company, has to do what it says. Otherwise, you don't have any credibility. And here are some examples of soft power. I will note that Secretary Gates, who otherwise appears to be a very intelligent man, does not include culture in his, but I'm sure he would if he had a chance to today. Um, and this is all in contrast to hard power, the traditional forms of coercion through military economic trade sanctions. So I think we can all agree that we're no longer in the era of men in suits around a table signing treaties, even, even women in suits around a table signing treaties, although that, of course, has its value, such as here in ending the Vietnam War. 
Um, but that's, that used to be really the main way diplomacy was practiced. And that's just not true anymore. There is power expressed in so many different ways. And this image of the Egyptian revolution is actually, I think, a very confusing image because um, the people really led the revolution. They attributed and felt Facebook and social media were very important. And they were, indeed, in, in, for gathering people, for spreading, war, the, spreading the word. But don't be too fooled by this, because a very small percentage of the Egyptian people actually use uh, Facebook. It's really the people. Um, so just some basic ideas. We're talking about no longer just government to government. Of course, that will always exist, especially when we talk about countries becoming nuclear and these issues that, that are going to have to be resolved government to government. But there's just a much broader texture to diplomacy, and it's much more inclusive. Um, and you have this elusive thing, uh, the voice of the people, uh, which is emerging in political and social movements. And I think the challenge is, well, how do you know what that is? And how do you distinguish that from the voice of authority? Now, there are a number of kind of public policy, foreign policy terms that are used to define what I'm talking about. Um, the broader category is often called public diplomacy. Uh, I am actually not a huge fan of this as a concept or an enterprise. It just seems to me that the idea that uh, if, if you're going to create a policy, then you yourself and the people who propagate that policy should be the ones who explain it and defend it, rather than kind of handing that off to another department uh, to do. Um, but I do believe very much in the concept of engagement, people to people, that is part of that and part of the process of cultural diplomacy. I'm going to suggest expanding that a little bit um, and varying the way it's traditionally been used. So I'm really going to be talking about culture, politics, and society and how they interact. Uh, and how, what is a good way to deal with them today. And of course, another important factor in this is global business. Um, and here we're looking at, of course, the logo of uh, the most successful company in the world today. And I just want to uh, point out the characteristics, possibly the unique characteristics, I don't know, but the characteristics that are behind uh, that company of Apple. And I'll do this in the words of Steve Jobs. And I think this is important in an era when uh, there's so much emphasis on uh, technological engineering education, which is indeed important. But just as a kind of reality check, you know, for the most successful company in the world, its founder constantly emphasizes the intersection of the humanities and technology, the importance of creativity plus technology, you know, intuitive thinking um, and creativity as part of the creation of his products. I don't think uh, you could have had someone thinking, for example, of the iPod who didn't love music uh, and have deep and varied tastes in music. Uh, and when you look at what is the key to success of, of the Apple products, it really is that sensitivity to the user. And, and, and Steve Jobs was always asking, and of course he had this incredible sensitivity to design, how will this work for the user? So behind what I'm saying is also a very strong belief of the, in the importance of the hu disciplines of the humanities and social sciences in public policy and foreign policy. I'm going to suggest that 21st century cu cultural diplomacy includes intake as well as output, a way to understand countries and people. Um, and I'm going to suggest that in, uh, a new way of doing cultural diplomacy is to leverage local voices rather than sending people or things from country A to country B. Well, let's look at how this might work. Um, this is one of my favorite questions about the Egyptian revolution, but you could really substitute you know, policy experts pretty much anywhere um, as having been pretty much taken by surprise of the, by the Egyptian revolution of two, January 2011 to February 2011. 
But you know, anyone who had read the most popular novel to come out of Egypt in the last 10 years, which is called The Yakubian Building, or seen the film made out of it, which was Egypt's entry into the Academy Awards in 2008, nominated for the best foreign picture, would have had an idea, at least, of the degree to which Egyptian society was a pressure cooker the degree to which people at every level of society, and that's what the film and uh, movie shows, it through a building and its inhabitants from the people on the roof who live in tents because they can't afford housing to very well-educated and wealthy people living in nice apartments inside the building. None of them, none of them was able to advance in his or her life because of the system of endemic corruption in that country stemming from the government, but pervading the whole society. And so the main character who you see here actually earns a scholarship to university, but his father is a janitor and he feels constantly on the outside and not accepted and not having possibilities. He eventually finds acceptance in a mosque, he eventually leads protests, he eventually is arrested and tortured, which then turns him into a violent extremist, a not uncommon story in Egypt. So I'm not suggesting that anyone who read that book knew, would know that on January 25th everything would take off. Of course not. But uh, it gives a very different picture of Egypt than the picture you get from looking at and interacting with a uh, quote unquote president, you know, a, a dictator who had run the country for 30 years. Uh, another way that the voice of the people comes out is through music, particularly hip hop music. This is uh, a, an artist named El General who was considered the kind of voice of the Tunisian revolution. He was actually arrested shortly after Mohamed Bouazizi uh, self immolated. Uh, and it was people gathering outside the jail asking for him to be free. That was one of those moments during these revolutions when people looked around and said, oh my gosh, you, you know, there's so many people like me, you feel like me, uh, and helped to spark the revolution. But look at these words from uh, some of his lyrics translated into English. You know, these are deeply uh, political, but also I would say to you, deeply patriotic lyrics with a vision of what the country could be and should be and what a responsible ruler actually owes his people and what are the basic rights of the people living in that country. Uh, that's the interesting characteristic of hip hop music around the world. Its roots lie in American music from the Bronx in the 80s and 90s uh, by African Americans primarily who were outside the system, criticizing the system, uh, and giving their voice to what they thought should be changes in our system uh, in the United States, which certainly has plenty of problems. And this political side of hip hop is what has caught on uh, around the world. And then, of course, uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, were very important. Uh, and this is the famous uh, Facebook page set up by Wael Ghanim, the Google executive, in commemoration of Khaled Saeed, the young um, activist blogger from Alexandria who was taken out of a cyber cafe and beaten to death by Egyptian security police and then deposited back on the steps of the cafe. This is what he looked like alive and dead. Uh, and that Facebook page generated 350,000 signatures. Um, and, and in retrospect, people look back and said, oh my gosh, that looks like the beginning of a revolution. But um, something to, to think of is that many uh, foreign ministries, I don't know if yours particularly, um, advertises itself as doing this. The United States State Department certainly does. There's, oh, we have so much social media, we're so hip, we've got lots of Facebook pages, we've got lots of Twitter accounts, and that is very true and that is very important. But equally important is to remember that these things are two-way. And it's good to have Facebook accounts, but it's probably even better to read Facebook accounts uh, and notice what is going on in them. Uh, and so all of these collective events led, of course, to these, this, those extraordinary 18 days 
uh, which uh, have extended and continue to extend. This is an image of Tahrir Square taken in October of 2011. You know, they've continued and we're going to keep seeing them, you know, uh, change, a huge change of a system of a country. I guess <laughs> I would say with the exception of Singapore, it usually takes a really long time. Uh, and, um, you know, we can expect that it will take, I mean, they have 82 million people in Egypt, so give them a break. Um, it's it's going to take them a long time. Um, 18 days isn't enough, but it did change the attitudes of the people. And what people there often say is the, the regime may not have changed, the people may not have banished the regime, but they have banished fear. So what I'm suggesting is that actually through creative voices or through citizen voices of books, films, blogs, you can see what society is thinking. Then you have to integrate those into foreign policy. You know, I am sure there are plenty of uh, diplomats and policy experts who read the Yacoubian building, which, by the way, is translated into just about every language you can think of. But it also takes thinking, oh, wait a minute, what, what does this say? And how do I compare this to the information I'm getting from my government sources? And these voices also help you to understand the deeper meaning of what is going on. Because remember, people uh, standing in Tahrir Square didn't carry banners that said, free and fair elections, although they had every expectation that that would happen, and rightly so. But they carried banners saying dignity. Now, how do you understand what that means? You know, you really have to get into the narratives of people's lives. Now, let me take a step back at what is the most sort of classic example of cultural diplomacy and see what lessons we can learn from that to apply today. And that was, I think, the jazz diplomacy by the United States in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s when the U.S. sent its jazz musicians, and this is one of Dizzy Gillespie's albums, around the world uh, and where jazz was recognized particularly behind the Iron Curtain as representing a voice for freedom and a voice of freedom. I think what's interesting to note is that it was not only the music but also, very importantly, the musicians. And what was so extraordinary about the musicians as representative of American Western values was that these primarily African American musicians were living in the United States in an era of terrible segregation. So while they were being sent around the country as ambassadors of the United States, in the United States, they very often were not even allowed in the front door of the theaters where they were performing, much less into a restaurant nearby for a meal. Uh, and the really extraordinary thing is that everyone knew that, the musicians knew that, the U.S. government knew that, and they nonetheless were sent around as ambassadors of the United States. They spoke freely about segregation and the violations of human rights going on in the United States. And in fact, that speaking up, expressing their right to freedom of speech, and not only not being punished for it, but actually being put on a plane and sent somewhere else to do the same thing, uh, was what made the strongest impression uh, about what freedom of speech really was. I think we're in quite a different situation today with very different implications which have not necessarily been totally absorbed yet uh, for U.S. policy. You know, as, as we all know, in, in that era, in the Cold War era, there was sort of one power, there was another power in opposition, and people lined up on one side or the other to a large degree. Now it's very, very unclear. It's not just a state enemy. There is a kind of amorphous enemy that exists really in nearly every society. Uh, and for the United States as taking a position uh, regarding so-called uh, U.S. values or the values we say we stand for um, in different parts of the world, it, a real problem is the inconsistency of U.S. policy and the degree to which we violate those rights we say we stand for. Now, sometimes when I say this, people say, well, hypocrisy in the United States, what's new about that? Um, well, I, I think what's new about that is that it's much harder to get away with today. Uh, and uh, we and everyone else is held to a much higher standard 
because of this 24-7 communications environment. You just can't get away with anything. Um, and so when the Secretary of State goes to Egypt, as she recently did, and naturally she met with the leader of the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, uh, Field Marshal Tantawi, and naturally she met with President Morsi. Of course you need to do that. Um, but when she says, you know, the, the transition to democracy must continue, you know, people in Egypt just laugh. Well, they didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, because that transition to democracy has included 12,000 arrests of civilians being held in military detention by the same leadership to whom the United States gave a human rights waiver and granted the full $1.3 billion in military aid that we have given the Mubarak government. In other words, no change. So you, you can't go around saying we stand, as I've heard many officials in the U.S. government doing, uh, we stand with the Egyptian people, we have always stood with the Egyptian people, and prosecute those kind of policies. Uh, people just don't listen to you uh, anymore. And I think that that is a misunderstanding of where security lies. I think security lies for the United States Interestingly, as much as a country like Singapore, which has realized this from the start, for some practical reasons, but nonetheless has realized it from the start, I think security lies in your soft power, uh, your power of influence around the world. And in fact, there's just an article today um, reflecting the views of Ambassador Crocker as he steps down from his position as ambassador in Afghanistan, having previously served in Iraq, and he's reflecting on the limits of hard power. I think people realize that. I'm not sure they are yet realizing what the alternative is. So let me look with you at some ways in which culture can play in this space of soft, hard power uh, and diplomacy. In Egypt, for example, where the polls show that the opinion of the United States, because of the reasons I've suggested, um, is actually lower now than it was in the time of George Bush, uh, there are still things that can be done. Um, I participated in a public-private partnership that involved the U.S. Embassy in Cairo and a private company, Share the Mic, over last uh, fall and winter. And it was an American Idol style contest for Egyptian women, open to anyone with voting on Facebook. Um, obviously, it attracted all different kinds of Egyptian women. Some sang in English, some sang in Arabic. Um, but what we did was to provide a platform for them to perform and for them to compete and for them to have a public face which they would otherwise not have had. Consequently, they were willing to stand in front of, for example, a banner that has the American Embassy logo on it. Um, because the American Embassy was doing something for them in their own terms. This is the, uh, one of the, the voting page. Uh, and this happened at a time when both music and women were kind of under siege in Egypt. Um, and the young women, young and old actually, who participated said again and again, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to perform. I helped a little bit with some leadership and communication training so that they could present themselves uh, at the concert of the finalists. And you know, these women, some as young as 14, said extraordinary things such as, you know, we are the generation that saw the revolution. It's our obligation to tell the world about it. Uh, it was a time that was very down in Egypt, so they sang songs like Hero, and you know, there's a hero in you. Uh, and they're not necessarily going to go on to singing careers, maybe one will, but more importantly, or equally importantly, I think they have the confidence, the self-confidence now to really participate actively in their communities in a whole variety of ways. This um, American Idol model, and I know you have it here too, 
um, has had impact in a variety of different countries. And I think in a way it's most powerful in the countries that are most under stress and tension and conflict. Uh, it's had an extraordinary impact in Afghanistan where it is broadcast by the independent media company Tolo TV or Moby Media. And there it turns out to be a platform for women and minorities. And the, the important thing about these contests is they're a meritocracy. So in places like Afghanistan, tribal societies, unfortunately rife with corruption, where it, it is very hard to advance on your own merits. And that's something you can do in these contests. They also, in Afghanistan, involve a lot of campaigning by the candidates. So you see a campaign poster on one side where they go around and pass out posters and, and campaign for themselves. The tryouts, this is the first day of tryouts in um, fall of 2010 in Kabul, attract thousands and thousands of people. As you can see, they go all over the country. They're open to everyone. You might notice a kind of dearth of uh, women in that group. There are women who try out. They're kept separately in Afghanistan. And I think what is a real sign of the success of this program um, is not only its winners, but also the fact that many more women are trying out and trying to try out so they feel they can be part of it. Um, it's an ext extraordinary, the viewership this, this program draws, 10 million out of 28 million people. Now I'm sure you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, there are 10 million TV sets in Afghanistan? No, uh, they're not. There are many more cell phones than that, but not TV sets. Uh, and so it becomes a communal activity. You know, people go to public places, you have 50 people watching one TV set. Uh, and some extraordinary things happen to the people who participated. This is a young woman who's from Kandahar, who's Pashtun. And her mother, and this is part of the documentary on Afghan Star of that name, which I highly recommend. Um, and her mother is repeating something that um, their friends told her, which is, they, that, that's her words don't participate in this contest, you're leaving us for democracy. So they saw the, this as democracy, uh, but at the same time they seem to have enjoyed it because she's convinced that the Taliban are SMSing uh, <laughs> votes in for her. So, you know, music is the universal language. It appeals to everyone. Something that I think is striking is that um, extremists such as the Taliban always understand the importance of culture. Uh, hence the destruction of the Buddhas in Bamiyan. They know the importance of controlling history. I would say that the friends don't always understand this. Um, sometimes they do and, and I'm happy to say the United States government is strongly supporting the uh, renovation and sort of reinvigoration of the museum in Afghanistan and we are certainly looking for other partners in this. Singapore would be most welcome. Uh, it's certainly, you certainly have a country that understands the importance of museums. The reason I say this is so important is uh, reflected best in the words of my Afghan translator who took me through the museum when I was there. He'd never been there before, 25 year old, fluent in English, college educated, and after we went through the museum, he said two things. I never knew Afghanistan had a Buddhist past. Now, I think if I'd said, but don't you remember the bombing of the Buddhas? He would have said yes, but that's not the same thing. You know, seeing that this was part of his country's history. That of course changes your sense of what your country is and what it could be and it certainly challenges a fundamentalist narrative. And the other thing he said was, I never knew my country had such a distinguished past. So you have someone who's 25 years old, educated, really the future of that country. And his vision of what that country can be has just changed. You know, it's not a, only a war ravaged place. It's also a place that used to be the center of Central Asian civilization. Well, maybe that means it can do something like that again. So I think the past, and this is uh, the Kabul Museum today, her heroically and miraculously opened. Um, you know, the, the past, if you can, dictators, authoritarian regimes always try to control it. 
but understanding the past is really the key to the present. Um, this is happening in another very interesting way, in another challenged place, uh, Pakistan, through, again, a rather unlikely medium. I think we can probably agree that Pakistan is possibly the most anti-American place in the world today. Uh, and yet, I think if you ask many people from that country what their favorite kind of music is, they will say Coke Studio music. Uh, and that is music brought to you, as you can see, by none other than Coca-Cola, who in a brilliant, certainly marketing, and marketing strategy, recognized about five or six years ago that in the very challenged environment that is Pakistan today, outdoor concerts were really no longer possible. This is a place that used to have the largest outdoor performing arts festival in the world, in Lahore. And because of the spread of extremism and the bombs going off so frequently, you could no longer have that festival or really any outdoor um, cultural events. So Coca-Cola hired the best musical producer in the country, and he put together a concept of a new type of fusion music, music that brings together po young pop singers and traditional Pakistani singers and musicians. So it reinvigorates the traditional music, it launches new musicians, and it creates a whole new sound that appeals to everyone. Um, in the group you see on your left, um, you hear their music out of the lorries, the painted lorries, you know, everybody listens to this kind of music. As a testimony to this, this is a tweet saved from Salman Tazir, the, uh, who was very sadly uh, murdered in an assassination. Uh, but even he recognizes that this is a great ambassador of moderate Pakistan. Now, how is it that you know Coca-Cola of the reviled uh, United States of America can so brand music in Pakistan because it provides something that is valued by the people. It doesn't provide, you know, American music, which they have plenty of and I'm sure listen to. Uh, but it actually found a very creative way of leveraging local voices. This has also happened in Brazil, and it's now spreading to the Middle East. There's a new version of Coke Studio Middle East. And again, in really smart, they're not just taking the Pakistan model and implanting it everywhere else. They're doing something else here, mixing Arabic Arab musicians with musicians from all different parts of the world, such as an Egyptian musician uh, with reggae music from Jamaica, as a way of countering stereotypes about Arabs and Arab music. Uh, so I think it, it, this again shows if you leverage local voices and do it in a way that appears locally, it works. Uh, something else that is spreading organically, uh, but in this case is supported by the United States government, is the kind of humor you get in The Daily Show. Again, this is not, no one has, you know, said you must imitate The Daily Show, uh, but Jon Stewart's brand of political satire is admired all over the world, uh, including by two Iranian-Americans, Kambiz Hosseini and Saman Arbabi, who have developed their own version of it called Parazit, which parodies Iranian politics. It's broadcast out of Washington. They could, of course, never do this in Iran. They would be killed if they set foot in Iran. Um, it's broadcast out of Washington on the Voice of America, but also widely available online. Uh, and it targets not Americans, but um, Iranians and the Iranian diaspora. It's in Farsi. But I encourage you to Google this episode when the two of them appeared on The Daily Show, invited by Jon Stewart. Uh, and it was really a, a mutual admiration society. They were so excited to be there, and he was so excited to meet them. At one point, they say to him, Jon Stewart, you are the prophet. Um, at which point he says, I hope this isn't going to get me into trouble, which, um, which I don't think it did. But, uh, and there's also, there are many versions of The Daily Show. Another that has really recently taken off is Basim Yusuf's show out of Egypt, 
uh, which has now started online in Egypt during the revolution, has just been picked up by M MBC and is going to be broadcast all over the Arab world. Uh, and actually the great thing is the Daily Show has kind of uh, partnered with these other Daily Shows and the writers work with uh, uh, the Parasit writers uh, and they visit the studios. So it's a nice um, kind of positive relationship. So I'm suggesting a new paradigm for culture, politics, and society. Not so much about promoting one country's ideas, but leveraging ideas and movements locally. Uh, and in this age of 24-7 communications, you really have to do what you say, walk the walk. There are various messages that we can get from these different countries, Egypt listening to the voice of the people, Pakistan, if you want to counter extremism, leverage these positive uh, uh, values and, and modes of behavior. Look for local ways to do it. Um, and in Iran, I think it's really important to keep the internet space open so that uh, these voices, alternative voices from the outside can come in, uh, such as Parasit. And Singapore, well, in, in all modesty and real modesty, and I welcome your contributions and critique, I would just venture that, that Singapore has understood soft power from the start. Uh, and it has understood that the way to develop a country is to build human capacity largely through um, education. And I am very struck uh, by the sayings on the school here. This one slightly cut, cut off, but it's a saying that says it doesn't make a difference if a cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. <laughs> These sayings, I understand, were chosen by the students here in the early years. So obviously Lee Kuan Yew understands the school, understands the importance of leveraging local voices. So I'm very, very impressed by that. I'm also impressed by this saying because just um, last night I asked a, a friend of mine who's a, a business leader here what he thinks of as a key characteristic of Singapore. And uh, he said, tenacity. And I, I find that hard to get as a national characteristic. But then I come across this saying which seems to me exactly the same thing. Um, so there's some kind of meeting of the minds here. Uh, I'll just end by saying I think Singapore understands very well uh, the power of culture uh, and the, the power of culture within and without. Uh, there is a very effective initiative called Spotlight Singapore. The, that beautiful sunset image is um, reflecting its initiative between Singapore and Cape Town. But this has been a collaboration between um, cultural leaders in Singapore, led by Colin Goh of Arts House, um, collaboration between them and businesses looking to expand internationally. And what they have done is, in advance of a, a business uh, incursion really into another country or looking to develop Singapore business in another country, they send cultural figures from Singapore to perform and also develop collaborative projects with people from that country. So it creates a whole buzz about Singapore in the country or city in the case of Cape Town here in South Africa. Uh, and uh, you know, there's already a sense of what Singapore is and could be, what collaborating with Singapore would be like, that uh, creates a great platform for the businesses then to build their own relationships. It seems an extremely enlightened approach to me. And then finally, I'll just end with the um, Museum of Asian Civilizations here, which I think in a way personifies Singapore's multicultural, multi-ethnic approach and uh, Singapore's understanding that its strength lies in this multicultural, multi-ethnic multi approach. That is something that, as I've alluded to with a number of examples, countries are grappling with all over the world. So I think that's something that people can learn from Singapore, but I would also encourage 
the lesson from the United States Cold War diplomacy, often an effective way to deal with other countries and to enter into dialogue with other countries, is both to talk about what, what you're doing right and also what you're doing wrong, what you're struggling with. I mean, no one has solved these problems. Singapore has an awful lot of good ideas, but no one has solved them. So that's often a good way to go into dialogue. We've, you know, we've done this, we're working on this, and what are, what are you doing and how's that working for you? Uh, but in a way, I think talking about soft power in Singapore is a little like, you know, bringing sand to the desert. But anyway, I welcome I welcome your comments and questions. All right, so we have about, uh, well, more than half an hour for questions and comments, and I would just ask um, that uh, you uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question and keep your questions and comments uh, short uh, and to the point. If, if, uh. So um, I'm sure there are many questions. <laughs> Why don't we start? Yes. Um, thank you for your discussion. Um, my name is Lucy Heffern, and I'm a mm -hmm. new um, still in orientation. Um, my question, I'm American as well, my question mm -hmm. is about in the American context, um, <laughs> to what extent does public diplomacy sort of have a seat at the table with setting U.S. foreign policy agendas? Yeah, I think this is kind of the problem, not, um, not, not particularly. And again, I think this is, you know, if you look, if you look in a, in a micro way, um, at, at the way the um, State Department is organized, I think it's characteristic of many foreign ministries. Things are divided and, and siloed, so actually people entering the State Department have to choose a specialty when they enter, and they can choose political or economic or global affairs, two which arguably belong separately, administration or consular, or public diplomacy. Well, you know, this, this is a system that was, you know, good 50 years ago, but who on earth thinks that politics and economics are separate anymore? Um, or that politics and economics are separate from problems like in the environment, of population growth, refugees, you know, this is, of course they all come together. And in practice, that's what happens. But in, and, and then how can all that be separate from then connecting with people and trying to promote those policies? It, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so the system is really kind of against doing things in a sensible way. Of course, individuals such as yourselves being educated, you are educated in an integrated way, and then you enter these systems that are not suited really for your very able backgrounds. So I think this is really challenging. And uh, the, a, a problem I see is that there's a lot of, um, talk about and real efforts towards connecting with people, not just governments. There are absolutely real efforts towards that. And I think in many ways the United States is a, a, a leader in the new area of e-diplomacy. But I, I don't think that the two-way concept of this has been integrated yet. And, and I don't think there's a real understanding of the power of soft power so that, you know, that it's not really possible to go around with credibility saying we stand with the people when our policies don't. Uh, and so there is, have been a lot of good efforts and a lot of good things said about connecting with people and empowering women and empowering minorities. And, and, and for example, Secretary Clinton, I think, has done a fantastic job of inculcating the practice that when you go to a country, you don't just meet with the leaders, you meet with people at all levels of society, and she has tirelessly modeled that behavior. But when the hard decisions come, they still seem to be made on a hard power basis. And I, I think that that is a long-term miscalculation um, in terms of security as well as other factors. So, you know, it may be up to the generations of people entering uh, policy at different levels who have grown up in this 24-7 world to really change that, because I don't think it's really changed yet. Uh, yeah, uh, I, this is sort of follow-up this question. 
I mean, the idea of soft power has been around for about 50 years. I mean, since Joseph Mao <laughs> coined the term, and in some ways, there's a Cold War legacy to the idea. And in addition to military did, did you say 15 or 5-0? Five, 5-0. Zero. Five, zero. So it's about 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately post Cold War, that Joseph and I started thinking about what soft power, the use of soft mm -hmm. power in America. And the question really is, I mean, I don't think American statesmen are dumb. I think they're quite conscious of what has been said. Mm -hmm. And yet, today we still hear Mitt Romney say America is going to be, you know, using its military power if necessary. I mean, so. Yeah, but yeah, he's not yet a, an American statesman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, officially, that's, you know, he, he has, there is a risk that he might become the next president of the United States. I like that <laughs> phrasing. I like that phrasing. <laughs> so Am I supposed to be nonpartisan? I'm so sorry. <laughs> the, the, the question asked really is, how do you institutionally translate our understanding of soft power and what you have given is very, a lot of substantive examples you can see. But how do you translate this level of knowledge into a decision-making process? <clears throat> I mean, there doesn't seem to be political structures for it to be, to kind of, if you will, filter upwards for it to become part of the policy explicitly. I mean, I'm sure implicitly there's a lot of consideration, as you say, Hillary Clinton nowadays makes a point to go down to the very, uh, people's level, but it doesn't translate. No. Um, yeah, I wish, I wish you would tell me. I, I obviously have been trying to figure this out. Um, you know, I think it takes, I think it's a much bigger change than people realize. And um, I think it takes real uh, courage in a way. I mean, in a bizarre way. <sighs> I, I don't know, maybe it's like Nixon going to China, you know? Maybe, in a way, Hillary Clinton's the last person to do this. Um, it, it, there's, it, maybe this kind of leadership may come first from the Pentagon. Uh, it, I mean, I don't, honestly don't know where it's going to come from. It hasn't come yet. Uh, but it may be something that's easier for a person or an entity that's more associated with a hard power to make this change. Interestingly, I find that people in the military uh, are more aware of the power of civilian instruments, as Secretary Gates said, than people in civilian. And that's because they know the limits of military power. Um, but there are so, so many pressures. It's, I can guarantee you one thing, it's not going to happen this year. Uh, nothing's going to happen in an election year. Um, there are so many pressures, you know, to be patriotic, to protect your country, and all these kinds of pressures. It takes really a seismic shift to recognize that that could come from non-hard power sources. Interestingly, I think, it's, I mean, I, I, Singapore is really an interesting example in this uh, and possibly deserves more attention. It's not the only one, but, you know, when it, 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 there are a number of examples of power and influence and leverage, particularly everyone's trying to figure out Asia now and we're told again and again that the power is shifting. Well, so this is one way to understand uh, what's going on in Asia. So it, it may come, you know, from other places besides the State Department in the end. <coughs> Thank you. Sir? Mrs. Schneider. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I can see you. I'm going to stand <laughs> up. I can't see me, but you can hear me. I can, I can. You can stand up. Here, I'm going to come up and see you. I like to see you. I'm Rohan Gurarat. I had a specialist in counterterrorism research and at one of the schools in Singapore. Your presentation is of particular interest because we have seen the capacity of extremist and terrorist groups to influence the general population, the ordinary people, has increased phenomenally in the last 10 years. And the capacity of the governments to counter extremist views uh, in the general population has decreased because by using guns and bombs you cannot influence the 
thinking of the ordinary people. So there or are, you influence them the wrong yes. way. So more sympathizers and supporters of these groups. And I think that one of the best strategies of countering extremism, ideological extremism, because terrorism is a byproduct of extremism, is to use song, dance, music, puppetry, literature, and these other methods of doing it. Now I want to ask from you, why is it that the US itself has not moved in a very significant way in this direction? There are some examples that you share. And, and what can be done for the US and other countries to move in this direction? Because I believe that if the United States is convinced that this is working, then we can get the whole world to move in that direction. I'm saying you invented Hollywood. You invented many of the modern communication technologies. But still, I, I think that it has been extraordinarily difficult to get the US to move in this direction, to apply these non-kinetic, non-legal methods to influence the ordinary communication. Thank you very much. I'm just going to answer this from up here in some cases, I'm just so I can see you. Okay. I'm not going to answer it from here. I'm going to just stand up. I'm going to stand up and answer it from here. It's fine, it's fine. Um, well, there's the answer to your question. It's going to start right here with you. you might, we, we have to talk, you have to come to Washington. Uh, I mean, I'm only partially joking because I think you, in, in a way, this, um, the mentality will shift when people see how this approach can work towards you really concrete, serious ends, and counter-extremism is about as concrete, as serious as you can get. Uh, and uh, it is so, I'm so glad to hear about what you're doing, and there's so many interesting examples of how that is working. One I didn't uh, share involves Pakistan also, where, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ajoka Theater in Lahore, where they and they perform very much grassroots of ordinary people. You don't have admissions. And they've been active for 25 years, and they do plays about Sufi saints and Sufi heroes from the history of the region. I can't say from the history of Pakistan per se because they date earlier, obviously, than 1947, but of the region. And I, I just give you one. Example, their play Dara about Dara Shiko, one of the two sons of Shah Jahan who built the Taj Mahal. Uh, Dara, along with his father and his siblings, was put to death by his brother Aurangzeb, who rose to power by doing this and followed a very fundamentalist extremist line. Why am I talking about this? Uh, the picture of Aurangzeb hangs in most government offices in Pakistan. He is the kind of historical justification for extremism in Pakistan. Dara is not particularly known in Pakistan. When uh, Shahid Nadim, who has run the theater for 25 years, wanted to put on this performance, they debated it in Parliament. They debate most of his performances. And for this one, they said, all right, you can perform it. I mean, it's very hard to censor your own history. This actually happened. You know, you can't very well say you can't do it. It happened. But they said, you can perform it, but you just have to not malign or Zeb. Well, how do you not malign someone who murdered his entire family, you know? But, hmm. uh, but these, so these his things, they sound like they're in history, but they're very, very relevant to the present. Uh, he also does uh, play Bule Shah about a, a famous Sufi saint. He performed it in Peshawar, the first performance in Peshawar in 10 years. The governor of the province wept when he had this performance there. You know, these, uh, these Sufi shrines are desecrated by Taliban. So this is very much the, uh, right at the point of contest in Pakistan. Um, <laughs> Shahid Nadim has never gotten one penny from the US government, including when he is asked to be supported to trips when he's been invited to the United States. So I have no idea why we are so 
tone deaf on this um, because I, I think part of it is it's not you know what you don't want to do it, it, we think so much what American thing can we send there to persuade them about this and that is just not the point the answer is really in the local culture you just have to listen more and find it uh, I am sure that somewhere in the US government there are people who understand this I am sure there are um, and so I'm serious. Let's talk. Maybe we can bring you. Maybe we can find them. Um, because and, and the other answer is just airing more of the examples. Getting the examples out there so people know about them. Not everybody can know about everything. So you just have to get the answers out there because um, this is where the people are. And so often the support for extremism is just out of desperation. That's certainly what's happening in, in both Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. It's out of desperation for what they're not getting from the governments. So that's that's another side of it is try to do more to ensure that there are actual legitimate governments that serve the people. So in Afghanistan, for example, I wish we were spending more tra time trying to ensure that there are really good candidates, and there are plenty coming out, not just the same old, same old, but new good candidates, try to, in to ensure that there are good candidates for the presidential election and conditions for them to run in. I'd rather see us spending our time on that than negotiating with the Taliban. into what we discussed, uh, one question back, on how to incorporate the new type of thinking that we were talking about. Maybe the answer lies in teaching of public policy, like in our school. Um, I mean, in our school, we have little emphasis on media, or social policy, or cultural diplomacy, or any alternative forms. So maybe the answer lies in that. I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I see many hands. Uh, so what we can okay. do maybe is to take three questions yeah, at a time. Sure, Would that be sure, fine? Sure. Okay, beginning with <laughs> this one. Um, I, nice evasion there. Wasn't that good? <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, Gautam Bahi and I come from India. Uh, uh, my question is that uh, notwithstanding, I'm just being devil's advocate here, notwithstanding what we've heard you speak about cultural diplomacy, my understanding of, of it would be that it, has its limits to the extent that people at the end of the day want you know you to put your money where your heart is in the sense unless you support your cultural diplomacy with your heart power possibly people will not really take it too seriously for instance uh, I remember reading Farid Zakaria uh, you know of the Newsweek fame mm -hmm. in his book uh, Liberal Democracies at Home and Abroad and he says he quotes a very interesting example he says you would find that uh, somebody some terrorist from the Middle East will wear Levi's jeans which is you know, most symptomatically American mm -hmm. would be wearing the coke, would be drinking the coke, you know, anywhere, which is again, you know, quintessentially American. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, uh, grab his, you know, explosive then truck into, into some, you know, um, some American embassy. To that extent, uh, how far do you think we can really drag uh, or we can push the mm -hmm. weather with, with cultural diplomacy unless and until you support with the hard power? I guess that, um, um, just ask you a comment on this uh, particular event. Uh, during the Arab Spring Revolutions, uh, mm -hmm. Russian TV party makes a very interesting headline by putting, uh, by well, putting, uh, covering the whole uh, Occupy movement in New York and major city in the United States. They put the label American Spring. Mm -hmm. How do you comment on that? Can you just introduce yourself? Please? Oh, oh, my name is Arjo Vinodo. I'm a, a, a new uh, student in academic program. Thank you. And, uh, Uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll go backwards maybe. Well, first of all, I think the British Council is like the gold standard of, of this. I think we, we, sadly in Washington, just lost a wonderful director of the British Council. Sharon Meem has done such a great job, but I'm sure they'll continue to do a great job wherever they do. They really understand this principle of collaboration and listening and develop, I think, really great um, programs. Interestingly, they are also the masters of measurement. Um, Sharon Mimas, the same uh, person who ran it in Washington, has a couple of publications actually on the British Council website on measurement. I personally hate measurement. Um, it, I mean, I understand the need for it. Of course, if you're going to give money, you're going to measure it. But you know, how, how are we measuring the success of the Iraq War? How are we measuring the success of the invasion of Afghanistan? You know, yes. Uh, the you know, Osama bin Laden is, is gone. Now Al Qaeda is kind of everywhere, but probably, you know, less powerful, but it's everywhere. Um, and these countries are, Saddam is gone, but the country's a complete ruin. Um, I, I just, you know, and I, I recognize the need for measurement. I always feel it is used uh, to prevent examples of civilian soft power. It's never used to prevent hard power. So I feel like there's kind of a double standard there. I don't think there's a magic uh, bullet for measurement. You just have to uh, survey people's attitudes. I, I don't really know that there's a whole lot of better way of doing that. I mean, just for cursory, for example, for the Sing Egyptian Women contest, we ha were able to document that people voted on that from all over the world, I mean, including all over Asia, all over you know Southeast Asia. So we we can document that many, many people were observed this, partook in it. It's harder to document in what way it affected them, but at least you can document that they were there. So that's something you can do, but I, I think there's a double standard on it. Um, yeah, you could say that the, the Occupy movement is the American Spring, but didn't have, unfortunately, you know, it didn't have anywhere near the same impact. And it was directed in a different way. The Occupy movement, um, I guess, was in Washington, D.C., but the initial thing was against Wall Street and against a kind of culture of, um, I suppose, the extreme division of rich and poor in the United States and the power of money in the United States. I think if you ask most people today what they think is the biggest threat facing the United States, they will probably say the extreme division of rich and poor, rather, and the growing division of rich and poor. So, uh, rather than something from the outside. So I think the Occupy movement has their fingers on the pulse. In contrast to the Arab Spring, the people leading the um, Occupy movement haven't necessarily been uh, people who have emerged as real leaders of society and politics. But um, the ideals are very similar. Um, uh, the idea of the par of the terrorist wearing um, blue jeans, I think, uh, which is absolutely true. Um, I'm not suggesting uh, and really talking about trying to persuade or certainly push um, extremists. You know, I think there are people who are really hard to reach. Um, what I'm uh, talking about are the people that you were talking about, the everybody in, in between. In a way, it's a little bit like uh, the Cold War. There was, in, the, in those days, the Soviet Union and the United States, and we were trying to meet, reach everybody in between. Uh, now there's different forms of extremism uh, and different forms of moderation, and both trying to reach everybody in between. Uh, so I think what I'm trying to talk about are ways to reach the people in between uh, so that they aren't persuaded to go to extremists, extremism. Once you have someone who has become so desperate that they're willing to strap a bomb to themselves and go into a crowded marketplace, I don't think there's, even doesn't matter what they're wearing or drinking for they go, I, I don't think there's anything you can do much to persuade them away from that. The point is to get people before they become that way. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm a, my name is Sui King. I'm a part time MPA student. Um, just a follow on question from the hard power, soft power divide. I'm reminded of Lyndon B. Johnson when he said, um, speak softly but carry a big mm -hmm. stick. So, my question is. <laughs> <laughs> that was then. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Remember the Vietnam War? <laughs> Have there been any instances where soft power was successfully projected without any evidence of hard power in the background, either militarily, economically, or even demographically? Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's the, the prime example. There were, of course, many factors, but um, the projection of, I, you know, it's it just literally offering the vision of another place, another way of life, other, uh, other ways of living, other ideas, uh, was hugely influential there. So I think that is an example, and, you know, Vietnam. Lyndon B. Johnson did lose the presidency because of the Vietnam War, though. So. More questions? Suppose if I could just add to that question I a little you, bit. No, no, I think you should answer it. No, <laughs> why would I want to do that? <laughs> That's your research. But no. I mean, it's um, uh, the political economy aspect uh -huh. of it, right? And a lot of these brands and products are actually um, uh, the production of, of corporations, right? Whose purposes are profits, uh -huh. mainly in the global corporations. So when we factor this sort of thing into our notion of public diplomacy, soft power, what changes in our understanding? Yeah, no, I think those are both good um, questions, but I think, um, the, and, and it's a fascinating, fascinating subject, the, the impact and influence of uh, soap opera dramas around the world, uh, which is just points to the importance of narrative and stories and communicating any kind of message and how powerful that is. I and mean, basically, we all make decisions based on our emotions. You know, we don't like to think that. I'm sorry to say that in a school of public policy, but it's just true, it's neurologically true. So these stories, for example, um, about you know, the Turkish soap operas, for example, in Saudi Arabia, about or, or the Colombian soap operas in Iran, or the Korean soap operas in Iran, where they're very popular, uh, about uh, family dramas with powerful women who kind of take control of their lives, but do it in a way that is culturally you know, acceptable and, and uh, understandable to an Iranian audience. They have huge impact and huge um, economic impact as well. I actually don't think there's a big role for governments in promoting this because, as you point out, these aren't done by governments. The, the successful soap opera dramas are all done by private companies. Um, and they succeed because they're good. You know, they, they succeed because people want to, to watch them. Um, and so that's the power. And then the economy comes, you know, everything comes in the sort of spin-off now. The economy comes in tourism, as you say, in, in purchasing of goods, in the sort of classic soft power and feeling and affinity for a country because of these stories. Turkey now has a huge influx of tourism from the Gulf and from Saudi Arabia. Everybody wants to go see the house where the soap opera takes place. Um, you know, that was never planned in the beginning, but that's happening. <laughs> now, there is a role, there can be a role for government. I'll give uh, an example involving um, Iran. There is a channel actually run by the same uh, media company as the uh, who do Afghan Star, Moby Media. They also have a, a division that broadcasts into Iran. Actually, there is no government in this. It's called Farsi One. But this is also a totally private venture, actually. Um, Rupert Murdoch's one of the invest investors in it. And they broadcast soap operas, all soap operas, nothing political. 
uh, into Iran from Dubai. It's also accessible for the diaspora. And they found, interestingly enough, the two most popular are Colombian and Korean. So that's what they broadcast. Uh, it's, it's a for-profit venture, so they can't afford to buy all of the most current U.S. dramas, for example. They tried initially doing older U.S. dramas, which they could afford. They didn't do well at all, because, of course, the Iranians are more sophisticated than that. They don't want to watch old dramas. But the current ones from uh, Korea and Colombia are particularly resonating. So I think this is huge, but I think it points out something you said, uh, and it's something that used to be distinctive of the United States. It's not true anymore. It exists in many parts of the world, and that is the private commercial uh, cultural entertainment sector. I think people often think when they turn on their television sets, you know, why did the United States send me that? Well, we didn't. You know, even Warner Brothers or someone didn't send you that. Some distributor in some schlock suburb of Los Angeles sent you that. You know, these are all um, commercial decisions and American products or Turkish products or, you know, whatever products are only seen because there's an audience for them because people like them. So that's what I tried to suggest with the Steve Jobs in the beginning, these entities of um, commercial entities that have a huge amount of influence and indeed have their own soft power and attract people in their own way uh, are another important player in the international diplomatic scene. we come back to Chobing. Right? Yeah. In fact, the question of drama is very interesting. Because in fact, there is now a competition in soft power between China, Japan, and Korea, mm -hmm. precisely on the issue of drama. And, uh, and all three countries are in fact using the language of soft power. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese considers that they have a deficit in cultural diplomacy because they are the net importers of dramas from Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they are, they are beefing up their cultural industry, particularly the television industry. In the case of Japan and Korea, there is actually very explicit administrative mm -hmm. support for mm -hmm. the export of, uh, of pop culture, essentially, uh, from both countries. So it's, and I think, you know, so in that case, it's taken mm -hmm. off very consciously. Uh, and the interesting thing is that as an economy, to answer, uh, as an economy, it's really not a very big industry. Uh, the, whole, uh, the entire Korean uh, media industry is probably the size of a medium-sized multinational company for the entire national production. But the interesting thing is that big. the visual, the visibility of Korean uh, pop culture is huge. Uh -huh. So the, you know, so the, and perhaps it's precisely because, so as you say about Singapore, perhaps it's precisely because of middle and small power mm -hmm. that are most interested in capitalizing on that. Because mm -hmm. the need to influence people is much more important than the ability to deliver military power or economic power. So actually, ironically, yeah. <laughs> some ways to study soft power is better to look from the small mm -hmm. countries small and medium-sized power, as Korea is being caught always between Japan and China. And one way to influence the Chinese mm -hmm. and Japanese border is actually through the, the Korean pop culture. So it's moved from mm -hmm. drama, TV drama to uh, K-pop music, which is now mm -hmm. like Korean Yeah, music. yeah, yeah, I don't know. No, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Thank you so much for making it. And I think it's important for, for let me make the distinction that the, the governments don't create the culture, but they do, of course, and we do this too, you know, through tr trade policies. You can support your cultural products through your trade policies and, and supporting them. So that is an excellent point and so interesting. I know the Japanese have gone around also um, talking about anime, and that's uh, the, the foreign minister called himself at one point a few years ago the ambassador of anime. So that's exactly what you're saying. I think it's so interesting. I would just mention, though, that I think the old, the, what I was saying about walk the walk still 
applies um, perhaps most to China, um, maybe not so much in the area of these dramas, but I was speaking to a group of Chinese education administrators in Australia, and I referred to the Ai Weiwei controversy and suggested that by imprisoning you know, their leading artist who they celebrated in the Olympics, they undercut a certain amount of the soft power they had from their Olympics. And one of the members of the group uh, entered into a very spirited conversation with me afterwards and said, you know, what are you saying? If he broke the law, he deserves to be arrested. Now, we can debate whether he broke the law and whether the law exists and all those things, but just stipulating, yes, that's true. If he is deemed to have broken the law, then he, the country uh, theoretically has the right to arrest him. However, that doesn't change the fact that you are then going to erode the soft power that you got from celebrating him and his works if you're going to throw him in jail. I have at least three hands. Would okay. you mind just taking no, a sure. final round sure. of questions? Sure. No? Okay. Okay, I'm ready. No, no, I see. I'm Camilo, a new student from the MPP as well, from Colombia. So oh, I great. You mentioned the thing about so first I didn't know we were a power on oh, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. My question is about the Olympics, so mm -hmm. happy you mentioned that towards the end of the last answer. Well, I was thinking in the Olympic back in time, back in the time of the Third Reich and then maybe during the Cold War, where the Olympics were an exercise of soft power, where countries were willing to show they were powerful and they were, well, they had they still a, are. some presence in the international scenario. Do you think nowadays the Olympics are still that, like, show case to show your power, your soft power? Okay. Sir? Uh, I'd just like to add on to it. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. My name is Paul Faisal from NDU at the uh, The issue of measurement that we uh, asked just now, we just came back, uh, myself and Mr. and I came back from uh, Sri Lanka looking at the program of rehabilitation of more than 12,000 uh, former LGBT cadres. And this is where some lessons that we, we will be able to share in seeing that there is a possibility of measuring uh, success of stock power where Professor Ari Kruglansky of the University of Maryland in the U.S., a psychologist, this, mm -hmm. this era of merging different fields, multidisciplinary fields, in terms of understanding this phenomenon of change using soft power mm -hmm. and we are experimenting, uh, where he was able to, to do a study of a year's change of mm -hmm. people who entered into the rehab program within the mm -hmm. camps. And the results were just released about one or two weeks. Oh, so great. Which saw changes to these 11,000 cadres in terms of their interaction in programs mm. of rehabilitation and touches on sports mm. and, great. and others. And this impact of terrorist rehabilitation, which we are trying to make it as a global imperative, have caught the eyes of many governments all over the world. Great. Where we also have seen, seen the changes in Singapore itself, adopting such approaches. But this, it goes back to this question of how can we sell such to the bigger mm. powers of the world. Thank you. And finally? Um, my name is Fazan Hashmi. I'm a uh, senior MPP student here, and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, my question is, um, well, sort of a comment as well, but I'm, I guess it's pretty clear that soft power is really, well, powerful in international relations, diplomacy, etc., etc. But ironically, at the same time, I find it very sensitive or sort of helpless in the face of hard power anyway, because take a case of, take the case of Pakistan again, where things like Coke Studio and theater and everything is trying to, you know, make people think in a different sort of way more liberal, more tolerant, etc., etc. But when the drone attacks happen mm -hmm. up north, uh, and uh, hundreds of people, well, not hundreds of people, but I, I guess now they're in the hundreds, yeah, civilians die, and they're considered to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just a, just another statistic. I kind of believe that even though soft power is really um, potent in that sense, but at the same time, it's extremely vulnerable to hard power as well. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. 
Please. Yeah, well, thank you. It's good to end with an easy question. Um, <laughs> I think I'll start with the Olympics and then <laughs> work my way up to that one. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, the Olympics, of course, are still incredibly important. That's why countries vie so desperately to be able to host them. You have the attention of, you know, basically the world for 35 minutes. It's quite extraordinary what's possible to be done. Um, and so we can, it'd be interesting to hear what you think, I and mean, you can all talk about it um, later, but what people think of the uh, British program that we just saw, which I think it's mean, I've, I've heard good and mixed things about it. Good that it was so, so clever and witty and they were able to poke fun at themselves, which I think is a wonderful, refreshing idea for an Olympic ceremony. Um, bad in that if you're not kind of British or Western oriented that it wasn't so easy to understand, which is, seems pretty inexcusable in today's world, not to figure out some way to do something, at least provide some kind of commentary or something so that people can know what you're uh, talking about. Or some of the early tweets I read about it, was, <laughs> which I love, they've nailed the tenured English professor demographic, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> I don't think what they were going for. But, <laughs> but, but the, the humorous part of it, I think, was, was great, and certainly the participation of Queen Elizabeth was great. And that sends its own kind of message of we are a country that can do this kind of thing. In, in many ways, I think the best thing about the British British Olympic cultural component happened beforehand, the Globe to Globe Festival, which was, I think, a brilliant idea where the Globe Theater invited countries around the world to do their own performance in their own language and their own cultural interpretation of Shakespeare plays. There was some bizarre assigning of plays, I will say. China did Richard III. And Pakistan was asked to do Taming of the Shrew, of all really strange ideas. Mm. Uh, but, but I understand that they turned it to their advantage, and the young woman who played Kate delivered the last speech in a beautifully ironic way. But all of that notwithstanding, it was a great idea. And they brought all of these different theater companies from all over the world to London, had huge audiences, and you know, developed long-standing relationships with these theater companies countries, uh, companies, and of course, what's the underlying message? We in Great Britain have the universal guy, Shakespeare, you know, who speaks to all of you, and you all, it means something to all of you. But it, that message is communicated so beautifully that way. Again, I would say by leveraging local voices rather than beating over the head with how great Shakespeare is. Uh, just one other Olympic example that I would use is the Sydney Olympics. Where I'm, and I've just been in Australia, and I'm not sure they've gotten this message, oddly. But you know, if you if you remember the cultural program from the Sydney Olympics, you would have thought that the only people who inhabit that country are Aborigines, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know that is not entirely true. But it was nonetheless a great thing to say. Wait a minute, you know what is special about our culture? What do we really want to show? Uh, and that was a big step for that country. And I think it had in some way a, a, a leading up to the eventual next great step in this area for that country, which was the apology delivered by Kevin Rudd, which has kind of been forgotten now with all the internal politics about Kevin Rudd, but which was nonetheless a great thing, the public apology to the Aboriginal population for the stolen generations. Um, so the, in, I'll just use that example. Australia led with that, but I don't think it's totally understood it. There is, for example, no museum of Aboriginal culture in Australia. Um, they haven't had an exhibition that they've led or taken around the world the way New Zealand has with, with, has with Maori culture. So sometimes the Olympics, you can lead with it, and then, you know, it's going to take you a while to understand what it is. But you do nonetheless have the world's attention for that time. Uh, and I think if we look back on the Chinese uh, Olympics, it was in so many ways so perfect for China, you know, so brilliantly done. Uh, but also not particularly reciprocal. It was kind of all, this is us, here we, here, here we are. So they're very revealing, the Olympics. I, I think it's fascinating. Um, I'd love to hear this story about measurement, and I'd love to talk with you more and, and hear more about it. It is, I didn't mean to dismiss measure, measurement altogether at all. That is exactly the way you do it. 
You, you take a long time and carefully measure attitudinal change. That is absolutely the way to do it. Sadly, what I find is that people are expected to show positive measurement and no one's willing to fund the work that it takes to actually do that. So I'm so glad to hear that's happened. It seems like a, a brilliant way to do it and a perfect approach. And the answer is to get that out as much as possible. And I'd be happy to talk with you about um, how to do that. Hard power, soft power in Pakistan, I think it is so true. And, and it's such a problematic situation. I think, though, if you take a step back, it's not just about whether you fund um, theater and music and promote it, um, it's also where the overall funding and emphasis is going. And for our government, at least, we give a huge amount of funding to the Pakistani military, which I simply, for the life of me, cannot understand because as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that money goes into the Pakistani military, a certain amount of it ends up in the hands of the ISI, and a certain amount of that ends up in the hands of the extremists. So we're essentially funding the people who are then killing Americans, and then we send drones to kill those extremists, which makes people mad and follow the extremists. So I mean, I, it's obviously more complicated than that, but there is that kind of circle. So I think um, you know, the extremists threaten the Pakistani population more than the American population. And the Pakistani population is the one that is bearing the brunt. There is no question about that. And that is something that's not realized, whether it's from drones or whether it's from attacks. Uh, and that's something I think that is not sufficiently realized in the United States. On the other hand, that's all we ever hear about Pakistan. We never hear about the other things going on there. You know, the incredible ph philanthropic efforts, for example, that are happening in, in lieu of and in spite of the government, which is not providing all the services it should. We don't hear about, you know, all of the civilian efforts, particularly by young people. We don't hear about the cultural efforts, all these things. So I think part of the problem, and this is maybe where I'll end, is that there's a fundamental lack of humanization of the whole problem. Um, and a culture can't solve everything there, but I think it is a good start. And I'll end with a quote from uh, Wole Soyinka, the Nigerian novelist who said this at a conference held in the White House in the year 2000 on cultural diplomacy. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, politics demonizes while culture humanizes. And I think if there was a lot more humanization looking at these things in human terms rather than black and white political terms, we would have a better handle on solving some of these problems. Uh, thank you. Thank you.